Welcome to Understanding Islam. My name is Chris Hewer, and I'm going to be presenting this series of programs to build up into a whole way of understanding something about Islam and the way of life of Muslims. As each of these programs is broadcast, it will be available on demand on the Ahl al-Bayt website so it can be downloaded and people can catch up on earlier episodes if they've missed them. To go with each episode, there will also be an article available to be downloaded from my own website. This series begins with 12 episodes looking at the big picture of understanding Islam. Every four weeks, we will have a question and answer session and you are most welcome to email in questions that I will address on this extended program every fourth week. Let's begin by a few words of introduction about the way in which I intend to build this program. First of all, I start from the principle that Islam is what Muslims say it is. Muslims themselves are the best people to understand their own religion. And so I will be trying to take you into a journey of understanding to see Islam through Muslim eyes. I am a Christian, as my name suggests, and so I am bound by certain ethical principles of my own faith and tradition. One of these is to say, that we should do to other people what we would have them do to us. And so I hope to teach about Islam in a way that I would like other people to teach about my own Christian faith. I would be very annoyed if somebody was going to try to distort my faith and way of life in their teaching. And so I will try not to do that in these episodes. I also would hope that someone would seek to understand my way of life in its fullness so that they could get a proper picture and not a distorted picture. And that's what I will try to present here too. We could take two examples from the life of Moses. Moses gives us one of the great commandments do not bear false witness against your neighbor. I take that to mean, don't tell lies, don't tell half the truth, don't make up things if you're not sure. And so that will be one of my principles in this course. I also want to remember Moses standing before the burning bush when he is told by God, Take off your shoes, because the ground on which you tread is holy. In this course, we are about to tread onto Muslim holy ground, if you like. And so therefore, I want to do so with a degree of respect, realizing the importance of Islam in the lives of Muslims. We have deliberately called this course Understanding Islam and I want to say a word about how I understand understanding. Understanding is not just in the head, not just intellectual understanding, it's also understanding in the heart. If you think about a faith or way of life, this isn't just a set of intellectual propositions or formulae, it's also about a complete way of life. It's about a human disposition. And we can't just understand that in our heads. We need to engage our hearts as well. And so I hope to take us on a journey of understanding between head and heart. The reality is that in every faith tradition, there are wonderful ideals, 
but there are also some pretty awful realities down through history that applies to Islam, it applies also to Christianity and to any other great world faith. If we spend all our time just looking at the realities, then we never see the wonderful ideals. It's a bit like a gardener. If you just go into the garden looking for weeds, you'll always find them. And you'll be so obsessed with weeds that you will never see the beautiful plants. So we need to see ideals, and then we can understand how far short of the ideals those realities fall. We need also to remember when we're talking about ideals and when we're talking about realities. Because the common thing is that I compare my wonderful ideals with your terrible realities, and in that way we always win. This course is about understanding, but it's not requiring everybody to agree with everything that I say. The Quran tells people, use your head, puzzle it out, think about it, ponder on these things. Does it make sense? And so agreement and understanding are different things. It's perfectly in order to put critical questions and it's perfectly in order to say that doesn't make sense or I don't believe that. This course is to promote understanding. So let us begin. The first question is where to start? Now very often Muslims will begin talking about Islam. There was a prophet called Muhammad who was born in the year 570 of the Common Era, that's what Christians call AD, in a place called Mecca, which is in the Arabian Peninsula, down on the west side over toward the Red Sea. That's where most of the books begin. That's where most people start talking about Islam. And so let's say a word about that. Muhammad, born in 570, and for the first 40 years of his life, grew up to manhood and was a merchant based in Mecca. In the year 610, he said that he started to receive a revelation from God, which was written down in the Quran. Over the next 22 years, this revelation came bit by bit in different circumstances throughout the rest of his life. In 622, Muhammad moved from Mecca, 300 kilometers further north, to a city called Medina. This was a crucial event in the history of the early Muslim community and is called the Hijra or migration. It's from this event that the Muslim calendar is dated. During the last 10 years of his life in Medina, Muhammad was able to lead a whole community of people so that we can say this was the first established Muslim community. And it lasted until his death in 632. We can see now that his life can be divided into three parts. The first 40 years before the revelation begins, and then from 610 to 622, the life of a small Muslim community in Mecca who were persecuted, who were made up of small numbers of people, often not the leaders of society, but women, children, young people, the second sons of families, slaves, servants, people like this. And there are three messages that were in this first period. The first and most important was, there is only one God. Stop worshipping anything else. The second, live an ethical life. 
be just and honest in all your dealings. And the third, this life is not all there is. After this life, there will be judgment and there will be the life hereafter. Now from 622 onwards, Muhammad begins the second part of the community life of Islam in Medina. The situation is now quite different. No longer are the Muslims a very small persecuted minority, but now their numbers grow. Muhammad becomes the leader of what we can call a city-state of Medina. Not only is he the spiritual leader, but he's also the political, the legal, and indeed the military leader as well. This is the second phase then of the life of the Muslim community under his leadership. Now, if we begin the story there, we are in fact going to distort our understanding of Islam. Because Islam never says that Muhammad is the only messenger or prophet sent by God, but always that he is the last. And if you are the last, then there must have been others that went before. In the same way, Islam never says that the Quran is the only scripture sent by God, but always the last. Therefore, there must have been others that went before. So if we begin the story there, we end up distorting it. Like you were reading a detective thriller and you opened it at the 10th chapter. You get the denouement, but you miss the plot. So we need to go in search of another starting point. We could go back into a biblical starting point. We could go back to the time of Abraham. In the Bible, we read that Abraham was married to two wives, his first wife, Sarah, and then a second wife, Hagar, who was an Egyptian. Now, Abraham and Hagar together produced the son, Ishmael. Some time later, Sarah also received a message from God to say that she was to be blessed with a son and Abraham and Sarah together produced Isaac. It is from Isaac that we get the descent of the Hebrew people, who feature strongly in the Bible, of whom, of course, is born Moses, and therefore we can speak of Judaism. Jesus was born a Jew, and therefore we can speak of Christianity separating from the Jewish tradition. And so Christianity and Judaism are necessarily linked. Often though, we forget the third part of the family tree because the Bible goes on to tell us that God sends Abraham a message to let the child and his mother go that's Hagar and Ishmael, to let them go into the desert and God will protect them and God will raise up from them a mighty people. The Bible calls these people the Ishmaelites. We know them better today as the Arabs, the dwellers between the Red Sea and the great rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Of these people is born Muhammad, and therefore we have the third in the family that are sometimes called the Abrahamic family of faiths, cousins in the faith of Abraham, or three faiths with a particular place for Abraham in their tradition. Now we can see that we have broadened out our starting point because we have Muhammad, the last prophet sent by God, 
But earlier prophets, according to the Quran, included Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Ishmael, and Jesus. Muhammad received the last book, the Quran, but earlier books were sent to Jesus, Moses, and to Abraham. But there were many hundreds of other books. There were hundreds of thousands of other prophets. All that this starting point does is to tell us about one small group of the peoples of the earth, that is, the Semitic peoples of the Middle East. We need to go in search of an earlier starting point. If we go in search of a starting point, the only place that Muslims would begin that discussion is with God, because God is the only eternally existing being. In other words, God existed and there was nothing else. And that's the point where we have to begin our conversation. Now, as soon as you put a capital G on the word God, it means the one and only. You never see the word God with a capital G with an S on the end. It doesn't have a plural. The Arabic word Allah means the one and only God. It does not have a plural form. Now, it is an Arabic word, meaning the one and only God. It's not a Muslim word. Of course, Muslims all over the world read the Quran in Arabic, they pray in Arabic, and therefore they speak of God as Allah. But we have to remember that there are some 14 million Arabic mother tongue Christians in the world and they also speak of God as Allah. Also, we must remember that around two million Jews today are descended from those Sephardic Jews, the Jews that trace their origins back to Spain, who have lived for hundreds of years in the Arabic-speaking lands. They too speak of God as Allah when they speak in Arabic. So Allah, the one and only God, the God worshipped by Muslims, Christians and Jews. This one God is the crucial starting point for Islam. There is only one God, there is only one humanity, there is one human family. All human beings belong together in that family. God has no favorites. God guides every single human being to their common destiny, which is paradise. One God, one humanity, one destiny. Therefore, we can say that the human project is the same, to live human life fully and completely according to God's direction or guidance. That means that the message sent by God to all the different peoples of humankind must be in essence the same. There can be differences between one particular way of living out that message in one culture or one climate and another, but the essence of the message remains the same. One God, one humanity, one message, one destiny. Now this theme of the one God is crucial in understanding Islam because Muhammad, for example, grew up in a society in which people worshipped many gods. Sometimes we say they were idol worshippers or they were polytheists. The criteria for deciding are you a Muslim or are you not, have you left behind the ways of your traditional people or not, was this question, is there one God or is there more than one God? 
to affirm the existence of one God alone was an essential part of Islam. But so it was also in the time of Abraham, for example, when he broke away from the idol-worshipping ways of the people who surrounded him. Or in the time of Jesus, when the Romans had their own gods and Jesus, following the Jewish tradition, was emphasising there is one God alone, there is no other. And so at the heart of Islam is this message, there is one God, that one God is calling all humankind to live according to the same principles, according to the same way of life. There are not other gods. There are not lesser gods, tribal gods, family gods, nature gods, the gods of our people, the gods we've always worshipped. All that must be left behind into this radical monotheism of the one God only. You're very welcome to send email questions which will be dealt with in the question and answer session in our extended program which will come up in four weeks time. Join me for the next episode when we will be asking the question what is Islam?